Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. I'm back in our Father's Word. 17th chapter of the great book of Genesis. That's in the beginning. And we're going to pick it up with about the 8th verse here in a moment. Our Heavenly Father has just changed Abram's name to Abraham, meaning he simply put one letter into his name, which is the fifth letter. And in the Hebrew... Uh, tongue, there are no such thing as numbers, but each letter has a number, a value. And H happens to be the fifth letter in the Hebrew alphabet, so it, it stands for five. Five is grace. So God changed his name from Abram to uh, Abraham, father of many nations, a blessing to many nations, and he made a covenant with him. He will soon do the same thing for Sarai. He will put an H, the fifth letter, Grace, in her name, and she will be called Sarah, not changing her name from my princess to simply princess, princess of all, because through her would come that one who would be a blessing to all nations, which is to say Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And our Father promised, I will always be with you, this is the covenant that he made. And you should never feel lonely and you should never feel alone today because that covenant was made with your ancestors. And through the Son, it covers whomsoever will. Our Father loves his children. That's why he created each, each um, tribe, each peoples. Why? Because he loved them. And here we pick it up then with the 8th verse, chapter 17. We could call this the covenant chapter because this is where it's really being laid out. God's promise to man, you can count on it. Verse 8, and it reads, 17th chapter of the great book of Genesis. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the, uh, the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. I'm going to be there. I will be with you. I will oversee. I will overlook. That's if you have faith, and certainly Abraham had the faith. That's one thing that uh, if God told him to do a certain thing, there was no questions asked. He accomplished it. Why? Because he had faith. He loved our Father. Verse 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. Uh, and and uh, that's the way it was. And he would keep that contract, that covenant. It's, it's, it, what, what is it then? It's an everlasting, unchangeable covenant. That should mean a great deal to you. Let, let me just give you a little warning if it shouldn't mean anything to you. Because that was the problem with Esau, that God hated him in, as we come to him later in this book. Uh, he didn't care anything about his heritage. He didn't care anything about this covenant. As a matter of fact, he sold his right to it for a bowl of mush. And God hated him. You, you don't want to go there. You want rather to appreciate the covenant that God has made with you, promising he'll always be with you. He'll bless you. Those blessings are precious. It means the difference of happiness and not being happy. You've got to have God's blessings to find that happiness. This is an everlasting, unchangeable, even to this day, covenant. Verse 10, this is my covenant which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. That means I write to you today. Every man child among you shall be circumcised. Now naturally this is according to the old law 
And it is true that males were circumcised and on the eighth day. And, but now, as, as it is written in Colossians chapter 2, verse 11, circumcision now is for both male and female. It's of the heart, which means the mind, meaning accepting Christ. In your heart, you are circumcised. No more bloodletting of circumcision because Christ's blood on the cross was sufficient for one and all times. There, there's, no, there's no problem in circumcision for hygiene purposes, for health purposes, if you so choose, but don't do it for religious purposes. But here, it was in effect. That was part of the covenant. Verse 11, And you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be a token of the covenant betwixt me and you. And, and so it was. But again, I, I'm over, I emphasize again, in more places than one, the covenant, the circumcision now is of the heart, and it applies to both men and women in loving the Lord Jesus Christ. Under his blood, that becomes obsolete. Verse 12, And he that is eight days old shall be circumcised among you, every man-child in your generations, he that is born in the house or brought with money, or of any stranger which is not of thy seed. In other words, uh, this would, is an indication that salvation opened later to whomsoever would. 13. He that is born in thine house, and he that is brought with thy money, must needs be circumcised, and my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. That is to say, now, of course, that falls in Christ. And, and Christ fulfilled that, uh, okay? Uh, again, Colossians chapter 2, verse 11. Part of the things that were nailed to the cross with the Lord Jesus Christ when he was crucified. Verse 14. And the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised, that soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. In other words, it's the same today with a, a soul, a man-child, or a woman-child without Christ. You take someone without Christ, they're in a heap of hurt. What? They don't have these blessings. They're not in line to receive one ounce of it without loving the circumcision of heart, mind, body, and soul, that is to say, the Lord Jesus Christ. 15, And God said unto Abraham, as for Sarai thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah, put that H in there, the fifth letter, shall her name be. In other words, she, her name is changed from my princess to princess. The, the, um, uh, the, certainly the princess mother. Verse 16, and I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. That, what an honor. What a blessing. Do you know how old Sarah is here when he's saying this? 89 years old. And Abraham's 99. 17. And then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed, laughed with joy, of course, and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is an hundred years old? He would be uh, soon. And shall Sarah that is ninety years old bear? She was eighty-nine at that time. Is that possible? You want to remember, everything is possible with God. With man, no. With God, yes. Verse 18. And Abraham said unto God, O oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. In other words, uh, he was, maybe he was a little afraid that with this promise of a seed coming, that Ishmael would, be, uh, would, would uh, not be allowed to take part in this. 19, And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac. God naming another, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him. 
I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant and with his seed after him that comes to even this day. I seek means laughter. That's where maybe this is why Abraham would laugh. Sarah will laugh and be ashamed of it here in, in a chapter or so. But this would be the Christ child coming forth, the Savior of all. It's God's plan of salvation. It is forever, for if you believe upon that Son, if you believe upon that Savior, Emmanuel, God with us, then you have life everlasting. Verse 20, And as for Ishmael, I have heard thee, behold, I have blessed him, and will make him fruitful, and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he begat, and I will make him a great nation. And here you have the twelve through which all, basically all the Arab tribes and nations come from today. You have them here. This one that promised he would be a wild man. And so it is. Uh, verse 21. By my covenant will I establish, but rather, but my covenant will I establish with Isaac. Not Ishmael, but with Isaac. Which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. Now I want to make something very clear. Did this say he wouldn't claim Ishmael? No, it didn't say that at all. But he's not part of the blessing, no. He's not part of the covenant, that particular covenant. Well, there, there is an exception to that. Well, yes, of course it is. Why? Whomsoever will. But those that won't, hey, sorry, you're out. You're in a heap of hurt. Verse 12. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee, and this at this set time in the next year, verse 22, and he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. In other words, he, he left off at that point, and verse 23 to continue, and Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were brought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. Now sharpen up for me and listen closely. What is about to be said is important even to this day as far as identification is concerned. 24. And Abraham was 90 years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of the foreskin, 99 years old, 25. And Ishmael, his son, was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. 26. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael, as Ishmael, and Ishmael, his son. Now, I, I, there's, there is a very important thing here. In most of the, if not all, of the Arab nations, even to this day, the Arab children are not circumcised on the eighth day, but when they're 13 years old. It continues to this day. And I'll say that again. The Arab peoples of Ishmael, Arab, Arabian, and Ishmaelites, circumcised their male children on their 13th birthday. And so it is. Well, is that just a coincidence? It's the way it happened. It's the way it is. And it is an identifier which is very important, especially in this generation. Next verse, please. Verse 26, 27. And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with money of the stranger, were circumcised with him. And of course, that completed it. <clears throat> and again, I must emphasize, today circumcision is no longer done for religious reasons. It might be done for health reasons, but not for religious reasons among Christians. Why? Because it, circumcision is of the heart, 
mind, body, and the soul, which is to say it applies to both men and women in the accepting of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby you fall under his blood that was shed for one and all times. No, no need for another drop of blood to be shed for religious purposes because of the blood shed on that cross, nailed to the cross with Christ. And um, so, therefore, it's up to the person. Christians, this way, Arabians, 13 years old, they still continue the practice of bloodletting. 18, verse, chapter 18, verse 1. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. The, the, Mamre is oaks. I mean, he was right there by a big old oak tree. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. It's hot, and he's cooling his heels here, uh, too. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. You might say, well, would you recognize an angel if you seen one? He did. Because there are three here, but there are only two angels. Uh, you might say, well, what do you mean? Well, there are two angels, and there is also the angel of the Lord, which means the presence of the Lord. Verse 3. And they said, Abraham said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away. I pray thee for, from thy servant. Uh, and, and here he uses the very sacred name Yahweh. Verse 4. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Hey, this big old oak tree, just take a break. Five, and I will fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts after that ye shall pass on for therefore are ye come uh, to your servant and they said so do as thou hast said. And you know, many people say well you mean angels would eat bread? Of course they did. What did, what did our people eat in the desert other than manna, which is manna, according to the great book of Psalms, is angel's food. So, and, and Christ himself, even after the transfiguration, after the resurrection, partook of food, meat. He did. So it sustains the body, letting you know that flesh men are made in the perfect image of angels, that is to say spiritual bodies. Verse 6, And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. Verse 7, And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. I mean, he's going, to, he's going to take good care of them. These are definitely God and two angels. That's to say the angel of God being the presence of God. Verse 8, And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat by this great oak, that solid oak, an old oak tree, hard wood. And um, manbre in the Hebrew. And so it was. Uh, verse 9. And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. She's here. Verse 10. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. She was past the time of life. He's going to bring it back again. And Sarah heard it in the tent door, which was behind him. I mean, uh, bear in mind, she's 89. She's past the age of bearing children. And this sounds almost impossible. 11. Now Abraham and Sarah were old and were stricken in age, and it 
ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. She was past that point. Change of life, gone. Twelve. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself. I got it within herself, saying, After I am wax old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord, being old also? In other words, Abraham's 99, he's past age also. Verse 13, And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child? which I'm old. Uh, now, I, I don't think she meant any disrespect, but it just seemed impossible to her. And I'm sure that that laughter was a little bit of joy also, but also of disbelief. But she meant no harm. That's, God knows what you're thinking. So he could, he could read even her mind. Verse 14, is anything too hard for the Lord? The answer is no. At the time appointed, I will return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. I'm going to wind the clock back here, and you're going to conceive, you're going to bear a child. And naturally, it would be through this that would come the Savior of this world, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 15. And then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. She did not want to lose this promise. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. You know, don't, don't ever try to con God. He even knows what you're thinking, and he, he knew she laughed. But he wasn't offended by it. I think he understood, because it was, it would seem impossible. But again, always remember Nothing is impossible for our Father. And you must have the faith to know and to believe that. When, when you give up on things, he's just getting started. And so you, you don't want to be one of these people that give up so easily. I mean, aren't you a child of God? Then act like it. Verse 16, And the men rose up from thence and looked towards Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. He was going to help them out, show them the way, and walk with them a bit. 17, and the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? You think I should keep it a secret what we're, our mission is here? 18, seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and a mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Why? Because of Christ. I don't think we should hide it from him. I think he should know. Because God knew whatever he said and promised Abraham would accept. Verse 19, For I know him, he should, knew him from before, before the catapult, the overthrow, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may Bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. In other words, he's going to do exactly as I say. The, this is faith the Lord had in him. Why? Because he chose him before the foundations of this world. He knew he could count on him. This is why he knows and chooses the election. He knows from what happened in the first earth age who he can trust and who he cannot, who he can depend upon, and who must obtain grace through salvation only. But some are dedicated to serving the living God, were in the first earth age, or in this one, and always will be. Verse 20. And the Lord said, Because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, don't ever think that when the little ones suffer through perversion, God doesn't hear it. He hears those cries. Don't ever think for a minute he doesn't know, because he does. And what is one of the things that will bring God down from heaven? Sodom and Gomorrah. 
the cries of those that are taken advantage of. Verse 21. I will go down now and see whether they have done altogether according to the cry of it, which is coming to me. And if not, I will know. I'm going to go down and I'm going to check it out for myself and see what's going on there. As if he didn't already know. But he had heard the cries. He said, as bad as they say it is. 22. And the men, that's to say the two, not the Lord's angel of the Lord, turned their faces from thence and went toward Sodom. But Abraham stood yet before the Lord. That's to say the angel of the Lord. He, he's standing there. 23, and Abraham drew near, and he said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? <laughs> In other words, I, I've got a nephew over there. His name is Lot. He's got a whole family there, daughters and his wife, and, and, uh, and, and there's bound to be other righteous people in that village. Are you just going to destroy the whole thing, the righteous, right along with them? Verse 24, he continues, For adventure, there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? Would you change your mind for them? Would you save them? And of course, um, and, and, so, and so it is um, that he would do. Verse 25, that be far from thee to do after this manner to slay the righteous with the wicked and that the righteous should be as the wicked wouldn't be any difference that be far from thee shall not the judge of all the earth do right would, would you really do that you're the you're the judge we're not and we know that you always judge what's right but if we find 50 good people there. Let's go with the next verse. Verse 26. 26 reads, And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. 50 stands for the Holy Spirit, of course. And... Um, and Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, and so it is, if, if, which numerics uh, apply, 27. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, he's trying, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes. He humbles himself. He's, he's asking, and he doesn't know if he should have the right or not. He's going to give it a go. Because when he looks over and knows Sodom and Gomorrah, I think he already knows there's sure not 50 souls in Sodom and Gomorrah that are righteous. 28. Peradventure there shall lack five of the 50 righteous. Wilt thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, if I find there 45, I will not destroy it. Now, 45 in numerics is preservation. And so I'll, I'll preserve it. 29. And he spake unto him yet again. He's sticking his neck out here. And he said, peradventure, there shall be 40 found there. And he said, I will not do it for 40's sake. And 40, of course, is... Trials is probation. That's will put you on probation. It's just um, uh, one of the things that you see fall in the Word of God. So, so Abraham is kind of um, asking quite a bit. Uh, I think sometimes it's better to go ahead and just lay it out to the Father in your first go at it and say, "I've got relatives there that are righteous. Would you spare them?" And he would have been a lot better off. Because there's only going to be 40 righteous men and women and children in Sodom and Gomorrah. They're just not going to be there. That's how bad the sin was in that place. And God had already heard the cries. 
of the wounded, the offended. And he was down. He was coming down to, I mean, utterly smash it, destroy it, and everything in it, to wipe it from the face of the earth. And many might say, well, I, that's just a story. No, we, the remains below the salt old dead sea have been found where this city was burned. It's there. Verse 30 to continue. And uh, next verse, please. And it would be 30. And he said unto him, O oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Peradventure there shall 30 be found there. And he said, I will not do it if I find 30 there. Now, 30, of course, is the blood of Christ. That's the 30 pieces of silver that brought to the blood of Christ that um, would even, that 30 pieces of silver that Judas would cast down on the temple floor. And they would not keep that blood money in the temple. It was against temple rules. But they would buy just outside the potter's gate, the potter field where they threw out all that old broken, shredded sherds of pottery. And, what, and, and also, this was potter's field where, therefore, the poor would be buried. And what does it signify? That that 30 pieces of silver that brought the blood of Christ, that only Christ can put all that pottery back together meaning specifically what it signifies is that he can take a broken heart, he can take a broken mind, a broken body, and through his blood, under his blood, he can put it back together with the love and understanding that only our Father can give and bring it a healing and make it well. So, therefore, even with the 30, don't miss the next lecture. It is these laws still apply to today that that Christ is not fulfilled. You want to pay close attention. All right, bless your heart. You listen a moment, won't you please? The Mark of the Beast on CD is our free introductory offer to you. What is the Mark of the Beast? Many false teachers would have you believe it will be a tattoo on your forehead or a computer chip implanted under your skin. It is getting late in the game. You need to know what the mark of the beast is. As it's written in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8, many will be deceived. There is no need for you to be deceived. Christ said in Mark 13, 23, Behold, I have foretold you all things. Jesus indeed told us how not to be deceived, and Pastor Arnold Murray takes you on a step-by-step -step study of God's Word concerning this critical subject, the mark of the beast. The telephone call is free. The CD is free. We don't even ask for the shipping and handling. It is free as well. All you need to do is call 800-643-4645 to request your one-time, one-per-household copy of the mark of the beast. You may also request your free CD by mailing your request to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Don't be deceived by Satan. And there we are back again. Let's have the 800 number, please. 1-800-643-4645. That number is good from Puerto Rico, throughout the U.S., Alaska, Hawaii, all over Canada. Spirit moves, you got a question, you share it. Once you do that, please never ask a question about a particular reverend, denomination, or organization. We don't judge people. We have one judge, that's our father. And he doesn't need our help in that judging. Those of you that um, know and understand that, then let that be, for our Father can handle it. But you should have spiritual discernment. That lets you know who you should listen to and who you should not listen to. You should always rightly divide the Word of God, show yourself approved, not by men, but by Almighty God. If you want God's blessings in your life, if you want Him to touch you, if you want Him to feed you, he wants to, but you have to be deserving of it. Those of you that listen by shortwave around the world, it's always a pleasure hearing from you. And your announcer at the end of the hour will give you our mailing address, and it's always good to hear from you. Got a prayer request? You don't need the number. don't need an address. Why? God knows what you're thinking. He's right with you. 
So let him know. Once you do that, what does he want from you? He wants your love. And he loves you. may not love what you do all the time, but he does love you. Return that love and you'll receive his blessings. Father, around the world we come, we ask that you lead, guide, direct, Father. Touch in Yeshua's precious name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, question time. And we go with Sandy from Texas. Pastor Murray, I know that murderers cannot receive forgiveness in the flesh, but do we have to put up with them during the millennium? And the answer is no. This does not mean that God cannot forgive them if they truly have changed. It is not written that he will, but it is written that you are to exercise capital punishment and send a criminal, that's to say, um, that's, that, that is a special term that means criminal homicide. That means somebody that is just downright bad and has no reason whatsoever for passion, jealousy, or anything else to have taken that life, just to take it. Uh, send them to me, he says. Now, I'll judge them. So he will judge them. Now, it's, and also, I have to believe the person they murdered is there waiting also. So that's quite a few licks against you, but then... I, I still, God judges, and he judges righteously. So it's according to the person. How good can they repent? And you, can't, you can't con God. That's, but in other words, what I'm saying is there will be no murderers with us in heaven. They may be people that have committed murder that God has forgiven, but it will mean they're cleaner than a hound's tooth as far as anything like that ever happening again. It's not. Anne Marie from Georgia. Where do evil spirits come from? If all spirits go back to the Lord, then where do the evil spirits come from? Well, for every negative, there is a positive. The Holy Spirit, that's God's spirit, is allowed to traverse the earth. Therefore, also evil spirits, Satan and his fallen angels, their spirits are able to traverse the earth, but God gave us power over them. So if you want to let them mess with you, that's your problem. Because Christ gave you power in Luke chapter uh, 10, verse 18 and 19, whereby you can overcome them uh, in his name. So we don't put up with them. You tell them where to go. Uh, Denise from Arizona. Pastor Murray, um, you frequently mentioned the first earth age. During what time period did this occur? First earth age. Okay. The first naturally happened before the second. So it happened, uh, I'll be a little more specific. It is believed because of um, carbon dating, artifacts that we have found, that the instant freezing overthrow happened 14,000 years ago. And um, that would mean that we, the cattle bowl or the first earth age ended about 14,000 years ago. And this earth age came into being. It took our father seven days to put things in order. And how long is a day with the Lord? Uh, be not ignorant of the fact Paul would teach, and sec or Peter would teach rather, in Second Peter chapter three, verses seven and eight. Be not ignorant that one day with the Lord is a thousand of our years. So that'd be seven thousand years, and then we've we've got six since then. So seven and six is thirteen, which applies to the fourteen. So that would be when it happened. Tabitha from Florida, please explain what the scripture is referring to when it states love your enemies but it also says that you cannot love your enemies and love the lord because you cannot serve two masters uh thank you well it, it's really pretty simple it falls under the title tough love if you love your enemy you can't just let him run free if you love him you're going to fix his wagon okay so where he's either a decent citizen or he's not going to be now, that, that, well, that sounds tough, all right. Well, it is tough. But that's true love. 
In other words, you're going to give him an attitude adjustment until he is fit to be among mankind. That's what lo that's tough love, but that's loving him. Uh, the same thing applies to your own children. What did God say? Um, uh, that if God loves you, even he will chastise you. He's, he's going to thump your gourd. And that's real love. And so it is if you spare the rod and spoil the child. You, you thump their gourd a little bit. Um, and, you, and I want to say, you never correct a child when you're angry. Children are very intelligent. You explain to them why you're doing it and do it, okay? Yolanda from Indiana. Pastor Murray, when you die, does your body and spirit go immediately to heaven or just our spirit? Your spirit is the intellect of your soul. It cannot be out uh, away from the in your soul. Therefore, the soul being yourself, it goes into the spiritual body and you return to the Father. The flesh body goes into the dirt and goes back to dust, and so it is. Jennifer from Arkansas. In the millennium, will there be female souls in the 7,000 Zadok of Ezekiel 44, 15? Well, what, is it, what does it say in, in um, Acts chapter 2 where it is repeating the scripture from Joel chapter 2? It says, both my sons and my daughters will testify. Both sons and daughters will carry my word forth. So, of course, there will be females there. Um, in the millennium, will there be any female souls in the 144,000? Sons and daughters, okay? Um, in the remnant, in this earth age, are there any female souls? Sons and daughters, both. Um, you know, I, I, uh, some preachers have got it so, women so shut aside that they don't realize that Huldah, in the Old Testament, Huldah was head of the university, teaching God's word. You want me to say that again? She was a female. She was the headmistress of the university where even the kings went and asked her what God has to say. God's not opposed to using women. The one place uh, people show their ignorance in the Greek where it says a woman should be silent in church the word in the Greek, and you've got to be a pretty good Greek scholar to catch it because of the turmoil and changing, but it says chatter, which means you, you don't let anybody chatter in church. And, and, but God uses women, always has, from, from, from uh, he used Sarah. Uh, the 144,000 who will, are being sealed right now, and, and naturally, uh, I, I don't want to keep repeating that. Naturally, God uses women. Jeannie from Louisiana. Uh, you know, um, I, I personally think that women are pretty special because if there weren't any women, there wouldn't even be any male boys, would there? So I can put that a little plainer. If it wasn't for women, we wouldn't even be here. Of course, that works the other way around also. If there weren't men, there wouldn't be any women here either. So kind of the two tangle and works out pretty good has from the beginning of time. Jeannie from Louisiana. When we are in spiritual bodies, will we remember our life on earth in, in this flesh body? Most likely, yeah. Um, I, I made a new friend. This I then found the friend was addicted to prescription drugs and wanted me to try to obtain some for, for him. Should I disassociate myself from this friendship? Jeannie, you know, I think you realize that's bad news. Uh, wanting to you to become an enabler. God frowns on enablers. And if you really care for somebody, you drop the hammer on him. Well, let, let me explain. By that I mean you don't have anything to do with him unless he straightens up. That's tough love, but that's the way you do it. Um, uh, as long as they are addicted and are you playing shenanigans like this, they're going to get a lot of people in trouble. Make sure you're not in the crowd. 
Edgar from Stone Mountain, and I guess that'd have to be Georgia. Um, question, now I know that Satan was the wisest of all God's creation being in Genesis 3, 1, so forth. So our Lord Jesus Christ was not created. He was always with God, John 1, 1. He came out from God. Am I right? Please help me. Of course you're right. But who is Jesus? God with us. But uh, you want to be real careful when you say Satan was more subtle than any of the living beings on earth. His wisdom was subtle, cunning, wisdom of the world. It's not the kind of wisdom we want. Uh, he was sharp to know how to destroy because that's what his name is, is destroyer. So don't, don't admire him for his wisdom. We have to be wiser than the serpent with good wisdom, not the kind he's got. All he has is street smarts. All he has is street wisdom. All he can do is destroy, burn, kill, and bring bad luck. That's not the wisdom you want. It doesn't even compare with the wisdom that Christ gives us through, from the Father himself in love, in understanding prophecy. Do you understand how wise it is to be able to interpret prophecy? To know what tomorrow brings whereby you can warn the children? That's a blessing, but only God can do that. What is it? It's God's wisdom. Always remember uh, in Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, it tells you where true wisdom comes from. It's the only way you can have it. And it goes like this. The beginning of knowledge and wisdom is, re, is, is, um, is loving our Heavenly Father. That's the beginning. It's the, the word is fear. It means to revere. The word in the Hebrew works either way, fear or revere. Awesome, the knowledge God can give. That's why you can always enjoy. If you want to know God's wisdom and what comes from him, let wisdom speak to you in Proverbs chapter 8. That's where wisdom just cuts everything else out, and wisdom herself speaks to us in Proverbs chapter 8. It's a beautiful thing. If you can grasp it, hang on to it. But don't admire Satan for his subtlety. It's not good. Uh, he's wise, all right, but it's to do harm. Uh, unfortunately, he knows how to deceive people, and that hurts. In Luke, this would be who? Uh, who do I have here? I've got Robert from Pennsylvania. Uh, in Luke chapter 10, verse 18, Christ saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. We know that uh, Satan will be kicked out, arrive here uh, disguised as an angel of light. But Christ said, saw. I thought this was a reference to Catabo, but I believe you said it was future. Uh, can you clarify this for me? He, he saw this in, call it a vision, if you like. It was future. And that's why he gave us power over him, which applies to even now. But uh, he was letting you know that that star falls from heaven, just like you can read that star falling from heaven in uh, the great book of Revelations in chapter 6 and um, so forth. Jenny from Kentucky. My question, we have been having Bible study, and we are wondering... Relation chapter 20, verse 10, will bad people be follow, will they follow Satan? Will they burn forever and ever? You, you will find your answer in the great book of Ezekiel, in chapter 28, verses 18 and 19, that Satan, the greatest sinner of all, is turned to ashes from within. Ashes within is a Hebraism that means fini, over, and you are ashes forever and ever and ever. And um, ashes don't feel pain, okay? They're gone. 
there, God uses the terminology blotted out. Uh, Ernie from Georgia. Pastor Murray, I understand your message of how the mark of the beast is in the forehead, but I've never heard you talk about the mark in the, the hand is in that same verse. Well, it's to do his work. They are, if they are deceived on him, about him and think he is the Lord Jesus Christ, they're going to work for him. They're going to do his work. And that's what makes it double embarrassing. This is the analogy that God uses through uh, uh, Christ in, as the husband that returns and finds his bride with babe when he's been gone for 2,000 years. Woe to those that are with child and that give suck. That means nurse along Satan's work with that spiritual impregnation to be deceived by the false one. Uh, meaning the same thing as doing God's, uh, Satan's work for him. Uh, Sharon Lee from California. I've heard you and I've read about the six-day creation and the eighth-day creation, and I was wondering, were the six-day creation not made with souls? Because the King James Version only states about a soul being given to the eighth day. No, they, they have received a soul. All uh, that, that is... Uh, uh, everything, everyone that came from the angel, angelic world and were created in flesh form have a soul. Everyone. It is their self. Some of them are not very good. Some of, them, some of those souls are probably going to go to hell. But they do all have a soul. Uh, David from California, assuming this is a is worded correctly, when Christ resurrected, the malefactor would be um, in paradise with him. Did Christ, Christ o cross over the gulf and teach the souls that lived before he did in flesh body? Of course he did. It's written. You'll find it written in Second P 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 and 19 that when Christ died on the cross, he went back all the way to the time of Noah, that is to say the people, and, and uh, gave them the same opportunity you have today to accept Christ. Well, why would he do that? Because our Father is always fair. He's always righteous. It would have been very unfair if our Father would have allowed the Son in God's place to die on the cross whereby if we believe upon him, we have eternal life. And then all those before that had to live by the law, and it's impossible that all go to hell. No, God gave them the same opportunity to receive the Savior and have eternal life. And as it is written in chapter 4 of 1 Peter, many of them did. Uh, Marcella from Kansas, I really got a lot from your, pro I get a lot from your programs in our Bible study, we had a discussion on when the where, uh, where the devil is now. I always thought Michael had him behind him. Uh, where in the Bible is this? Well, you're right. It's uh, Revelation chapter 12, verses 6 and 7. That's when Michael and his angels cast Satan and his angels out of heaven right down here on earth. That's when that old star falls down here. And that's why it's called a woe trump, because it says woe to you on earth. As a matter of fact, it says woe, woe to you on earth, because Satan has come down and he knows he has but a very short time, five months to be exact, to deceive the world into thinking that he is Christ. Uh, but there's where you will find it. He, Michael is holding him, and, um, but Michael is also the one that will cast him out right here to earth, and what a time that's going to be. I, you know, all, God's elect look forward to that. They want, they want to face him because they know the Holy Spirit will speak through us, and what we say will even convince the gainsayers, Luke chapter 21. Uh, Scott from Massachusetts, uh, I wish I'd started sooner studying. Well, you, you're, you, it's catch-up time. Where in the Bible can I find the story about the three men being burned in a big kill, brick kill, a big kill, and the guy looking in and saw Jesus walking with them and they were not harmed? 
Well, you'll, you'll find it in Daniel chapter 3. That Those three would be Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the Son of God would be walking with them, and it was none other than Nebuchadnezzar himself that looked in and saw Christ walking with them. Nebuchadnezzar, this would be a, a, a lasting impression to him because he wrote the fourth chapter in the book of Daniel. And you will see him write one of the most beautiful prayers in the Word of God, written by none other than the king of Babylon. And it lets you know the power, saving power of Almighty God. Uh, Gene from Michigan, what does the Bible say about leaving your inheritance to either your children or grandchildren? I was told to, to leave it to grandchildren, but I can't find it in Scripture. Well, it, it doesn't say in Scripture, okay? It's, it's where you want it to go. Don't let anyone else make your mind up. That is your choice. It is your stuff. You know who has deserved it and who doesn't. And always, but at the same time, always be fair, okay? And uh, God will always bless you for that. Okay, I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all because you enjoy studying God's Word chapter by chapter and verse by verse, but you know what? Most of all, God loves you for it. It makes His day when you read the letter that He has sent to you, explaining to you how things are and why things are as they are even around the world. What an education He gives us from His Word. It makes His day. When you make His day, boy, is He going to make yours. We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, you help us keep coming to you. Once you do that, bless God. He will always bless you. Now, most important though, you listen to me, listen good now. You stay in his word every day. And his word is a good day, even with trouble. You know why? Because Jesus, Yeshua, is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's Word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800 643 4645 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you. Genesis 146, the first six chapters in God's Word. The world there was. Did you realize there was a world age before this one? Same old world, different age. The creation itself. When were the races created? You see, all the races were created separately, and you'll find that documented in these particular tapes. How, was the, what, how and what was the sin in the garden? It will be discussed in this series also. This is a must for the serious Bible scholar, for if you do not understand how it was in the beginning, you certainly will never understand the end. I think you will find this series very rewarding and certainly will answer questions that no doubt you've always wondered about. Genesis 146. Hey, I know you're going to enjoy this series. Thank you. 
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach brings God's Word alive with meaning as he takes you on a chapter-by-chapter, verse-by-verse study of God's letter to you, the Bible. And now here is Pastor Arnold Murray. Good day to you. God bless you. Say, welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel. Welcome to this family Bible study hour. Hey, we're going to talk about wilderness today. The wilderness is translated from several, several Greek and Hebrew words in the manuscripts. But I think the prime and uh, basically the one most often used and is used in most of what we will be teaching in this lecture I think that it uh, 